Last, last time we were talking about imines, and in particular we had focused on what happens when uh, uh, the aldehyde glucose accumulates too much in your blood and starts modifying amino groups on various biomolecules. Uh, but, of course, this reaction occurs in other contexts besides biology. You could take an aldehyde or a ketone and add an amino group, and you're going to need an acid catalyst. Uh, so this could be whatever. This could be acetic acid, for example, or it could be paratoluene sulfonic acid. Uh, as with acetal formation, you're going to need to remove water to promote uh, imine formation. The mechanism of this we did last time, but this is the imine product, okay? And this contrasts from the acetal because, of course, if you make the acetal under analogous conditions, when you get to the oxonium ion intermediate, like this, in imine formation, we were able to get to a neutral intermediate by removing a proton. Uh, here, there's no s such way to uh, make that oxygen neutral. So with acetal formation, we get a second equivalent of alcohol adding, and then that's our product. But notice in both cases, we go from something that had two bonds to oxygen to something that still has two bonds to a heteroatom. Similarly with the acetal, we go from something with two bonds to oxygen to two bonds to oxygen. So you should look at those and see the similarities mechanistically. Uh, you should see the similarities and see them as manifestations of the same basic thing. Um, Imine formation has a lot to do, it happens all over the place in biology, not only on accident when glucose modifies hemoglobin or other things, but also on purpose. So um, I'm going to take just a minute to tell you about an important imine uh, in vision by which I mean our eyes seeing and not Wanda's love interest. Uh -huh. um, all right. So this is a horribly long uh, molecule. It is called 11 cis retinal, and it is normally an aldehyde, but now it's tied up in an imine with the protein rhodopsin, which is an integral mem membrane protein that's present in your rod and cone cells in your eye. Uh, it's called 11 cis retinal because of this cis double bond in the middle. And that cis double bond has a characteristic shape. Um, when this molecule can absorb light in the visible region, uh, the environment that surrounds this molecule can tune exactly where in the visible region you, uh, it, it can absorb. So it can absorb in the red or the green or the blue. But what happens when it absorbs UV light is you promote an electron from HOMO to LUMO or from a high energy orbital to an empty orbital. That weakens this double bond and allows for isomerization to the trans uh, configuration, the more stable trans configuration, which again, I'll just draw and I'll just answer the question right now, do we have to memorize the structure of retinal? No, memorizing things in a day when you can look stuff up very quickly is not useful until our robot overlords deny us access to Google or Wikipedia, in which case, memorization will be, in uh, will be important again. Um, notice the change in shape of this molecule when you go from cis to trans, and this is UV light, that, or I'm sorry, visible light uh, that, that uh, makes this happen. Sometimes chemists represent light with H nu, just to indicate that there is a photon. I don't know why we do that other than it makes it, it's easier to write than light. Uh, but that change in shape 
If you imagine this molecule embedded in the core of an integral membrane protein, when that molecule changes shape, it makes the protein change its shape too. And then that gets transmitted into a downstream signal in your rod and cone cells that the optic nerve picks up and takes to your eyes and then you interpret as vision. Uh, and all of that happens tons and tons of times per second and many, many times while we've even been talking about it as briefly as we have. So this is an incredible process. Um, after the isomerization, and this is kind of cool too, it, it turns out the, the, your body has to clip out this trans uh, aldehyde and uh, send it somewhere else to be re-isomerized to the cis. And then it takes the rhodopsin protein without the retinal. Now it's no good for seeing anything, and it's got to recycle it somewhere to have the 11 cis retinal reattached. So that kind of process is just constantly occurring in your, uh, in your rod and cone cells. Um, all right, so imine formation is not all bad. Uh, in fact, it's how we can see, which is really kind of cool. Uh, the other really cool thing about this is that it's all about excitation of an electron from the highest occupied empty orbital to the lowest unoccupied empty orbital. When you do that, you want to make uh, a bond weaker because you're populating an antibonding orbital, and that's why it becomes easier to isomerize to the trans. Um, so, molecular orbital theory going on in your eyes all the time, and you didn't even know it, but now you do. And now you have an interesting thing to talk about at parties. Right? <laughs> Want to know how vision works? Um, there's another really interesting use of amines that your text mentions that I haven't talked about before when I've taught this class, but I think is interesting enough that we really should. Are we recording? Did I press... I can't tell. We'll just hope for the best, right? I did press record, sure. All right. No, now I'm paranoid. I really got to check. I really got to see because, okay, yes, we are recording. Been, I've, done, I've done lectures before where I did all the video, but the audio didn't get recorded. And so then I had to sit alone in my office, either doing the whole thing over or narrating my own drawings, both of which were painful. So <laughs> just want to make sure that <clears throat> we're recording. Okay. Um, so uh, proteins and amino acids. Uh, your body does lots of things with amino acids. An amino acid has this basic structure. There's a couple of different ways of drawing them, but I will draw it this way. Uh, we're showing the form that it would adopt at pH 7. This form has the acid portion deprotonated because its pKa is around 4. And the amino portion protonated as the ammonium because the pKa of the ammonium is around uh, 9. <clears throat> uh, so this is the form the amino acid occupies at pH 7. Uh, we have 20 canonical amino acids, that is 20 different sort of side chains, different R groups. We don't need to worry about those R groups. Uh, your body takes these and builds proteins out of them, but your body can also metabolize them and uh, send them off to various pathways to, uh, to oxidize the carbons and, and, uh, and uh, recycle the amino acids into other needed materials. So. One of the key steps in amino acid metabolism is getting rid of this amino group. Uh, and so ideally, you want to turn the amino group into uh, a ketone. This is called an alpha keto acid. And uh, if you've heard of the citric acid cycle, the term alpha keto maybe should sound familiar. Uh, this is a carbonyl carbon, this is the alpha carbon, the keto is the ketone on the alpha carbon. Uh, one of the key intermediates in the citric acid cycle is alpha keto glutarate, which uh, if, you've got, if you've got an alpha keto group, there's a very simple metabolic reaction you can do to, uh, to oxidize the molecule and break it down into simpler starting materials. So this is a, the alpha keto acid is a useful uh, biological intermediate, but you need something 
to get rid of the amino group. And it turns out uh, your body uses imine chemistry. Um, and you may look at this and say, I think this is an oxidation reaction because we used to have one bond to a heteroatom and now we have two bonds to a heteroatom on that carbon. And from a certain perspective, you're, that's true, but it's not a redox or oxidation reaction because uh, we're going to use a molecule with an aldehyde on it. And you'll see we're going to switch which molecule has the carbonyl and which molecule has the amino group. So it's sort of a self oxidation reduction process or a, a, a swap of, of functional groups. Uh, but it's really slick and it doesn't require NADH or, uh, or NAD+. So uh, I'm going to show you the structure of the cofactor pyridoxal phosphate or PLP. Um, you may not have encountered this before. It's possible you've heard about it in like cell bio, but it's also possible it's totally new to you, in which case that's fine. Do you need to memorize the structure? No. Um, but pay attention to the key functional groups. And that is the amino group on the amino acid and the aldehyde group on PLP. And uh, after the reaction, <clears throat> Whereas the amino acid loses the amino group. And I'm just abbreviating a phosphate group. You're, sometimes your cell bio or biochem text will just put PI there, which stands for inorganic phosphate, but it's, eh, I don't like that abbreviation, so I refuse to use it. Um, What's left on pyridoxal phosphate is the amino group, and this is now called pyridoxamine. Now, notice what happened. We swapped who has the amino group and who has the carbonyl. Okay? So I'm going to show you the key mechanistic steps here. What I probably am not going to do, well, hmm, fine. Um, so let's just uh, abbreviate the the amino group is R and H2, if that's okay. What we're showing is that at some point, either the enzyme or solvent can remove a proton from the ammonium group to give you the conjugate base, the neutral amine. And then we're going to abbreviate PLP as this aldehyde, okay? So imine formation uh, likely involves protonation of the aldehyde first. Um, your text shows the amine, Im, the, your text shows the amine attacking directly. Um, evidence is that uh, the, um, if the amine attacks directly, then you get proton transfer uh, of the oxygen at the same time so that you never see a negatively charged tetrahedral intermediate. So it's okay to draw the mechanism this way. Uh, if we draw it this way, this is general acid catalysis. On the other hand, if we show protonating the aldehyde first in one step and then the amino group attacks, that would be specific acid catalysis. Whether it's one or the other depends on the situation, so we can do what's most efficient and do it this way, if that's okay. Um, do you understand what we're doing? We're protonating the carbonyl oxygen to make the carbonyl more reactive, reactive enough for the amino group to attack, and as the amino group attacks and dumps its electrons into the pi star, the pi bond breaks. Good on that? Questions? No? All right, so then that gets us to the following intermediate. And your text calls this, um, let's see, then I guess the conjugate base of our acid would remove the proton. 
This is the so-called carbonylamine. And then I think probably at this stage I can just refer you back to your notes. And I will just talk through what's going to happen. First, we're going to protonate the OH group to turn it into a good leaving group. Then lone pair electrons on the nitrogen are going to kick down and make water leave. Then we'll get to an iminium ion, and then the final imine will look like this. Let's see, that's our aldehyde R group. Okay, you good so far? Sort of a review of what we talked about last time. Let me actually now draw out the structure of this molecule because what's going to happen next in order to understand it you sort of have to see the whole thing. Okay, here's the imine. This is the nitrogen from the amino acid. Okay, now um, I want you to focus in on this portion of the molecule, okay? Um, and I want you to notice that this proton that is alpha to the carbonyl carbon is somewhat acidic. And the reason for that is that the conjugate base is resonance stabilized. Um, so let me show uh, the conjugate, some base, uh, it's either, it's likely an enzyme group, uh, removing a proton from the alpha carbon. When that ha happens, we would get the following intermediate with a negative charge on the alpha carbon. And then over here, we have the rest of that uh, PLP ring with the phosphate group. Um, now, notice that that negative charge is adjacent to a, a pi bond here, and it's adjacent to a pi bond there. Now, via resonance, I could kick these electrons here and put a negative charge there, right? Or I could kick these electrons here and put a negative charge there. Um, I, I will demonstrate that. We don't have time to redraw the molecule three times, so I'm going to copy and paste. I realize you can't do that in your notes if you're using paper, uh, so don't worry about it. But I want you to see that this is a resonance structure of the molecule that I've just shown you, and also this is a resonance structure, okay? So that, that proton, even though it's not on a carbon that we would typically think of as acidic, it's more acidic than your typical sp3 hybridized carbon-hydrogen bond because the conjugate base is stabilized by resonance. You good on that? Okay, now here's the cool thing. I mean, it was already cool, I know, but uh, here's the... Here's the cool thing. If we protonate on of the three carbons that bear the negative charge, I'm sorry, the three atoms that bear the negative charge, if we protonate on this one, what happens is we change which side of the molecule has the carbonyl carbon and which side of the molecule has the nitrogen.
Uh, sorry. Okay. And I want you to notice before we did this, the carbonyl carbon was on the pyridoxal phosphate side and the, and the amino group was on the amino acid side, right? Because this defines who's, this carbon's the carbonyl carbon, this is the amine. Look at what we've done. Now the pyridoxal phosphate side has the nitrogen and the amino acid side has the carbonyl just by proton transfer, okay? So if we were to hydrolyze the imine, what would that look like? Well, first, um, at this stage, we can abbreviate this molecule as Understand the R's are just generic. I'm not gonna be able to track which R is which and try to make it consistent. Are we good though if we abbreviate, hopefully? Okay, there's too many R's. All right, so first we protonate the imine. What we're gonna do here is just exactly backwards steps for imine formation. This is imine hydrolysis. When you protonate the imine, you convert it to the iminium ion, which is um, more reactive. Now, water can attack as a nucleophile. That gets you to the following intermediate. I'm abbreviating this group as COO minus. Positive formal charge on the oxygen. Now, uh, we need to use proton transfer to change who the good leaving group is. So instead of drawing this out for you, I will just talk about it in words. Whenever I use multiple arrows pointing, that indicates that I'm skipping a mechanistic step. We would first remove a proton from water using the conjugate base of our acid to get the carbonolamine. Then we would protonate the nitrogen of the amino group to convert it into a good leaving group. Then lone pair electrons on the oxygen could kick down and kick off the amino group. then we would have this protonated oxonium ion, which we could use the conjugate base of our acid to deprotonate, thereby getting us to where I showed you we were gonna end, sorry, scrolling upward. To the alpha keto acid and then and the uh, pyridoxamine, okay? So that's just, it's a lot of proton transfer, it's a lot of steps, but they're simple steps, but the outcome is huge. The outcome is huge. You change an amino group on the amino acid to the ketone. Now, what is nature gonna do with pyridoxamine? Well, uh, there are a number of other metabolic reactions where you need an amino group, and uh, pyridoxamine is a carrier for the amino group. In other words, you can run this reaction backwards. If you have an alpha keto, alpha keto acid and pyridoxamine, you can go back and synthesize the amino acid. So if you ever learn about amino acid synthesis, it often begins with alpha keto acids. And this is a theme throughout metabolism. Your body wants to be able to do the reactions this way and that way, depending on what the needs are of the cell. All right, any questions about that? I realize that's kind of long and convoluted. But it's, it's uh, simple carbonyl chemistry with some proton transfers thrown in. Yeah? Sorry, can
Yeah, and it's that step. I'm zooming into where we've got the place where the conjugate base of this molecule is stabilized by resonance. The reason this works is because this proton is acidic because the negative charge in the conjugate base is stabilized by resonance. Okay, what else? Okay. Sometimes enzymes that catalyze, catalyze these reactions are called transaminases because they move an amino group from one molecule to another. All right, um, imine formation is useful in the lab too, and so I just want to briefly show you uh, a synthetic use of imine formation. So uh, suppose I wanted to make the following amine, diethylamine. Uh, presumably, I could do that starting with ammonia and try to do the SN2 reaction. And then I, uh, but the problem with that is that the primary amine is more electron rich more nucleophilic than the starting material. And so as soon as I form this primary amine, I'm going to go on to react with uh, some, some of the remaining alkyl bromide to get the diamine, but the diamine is even more nucleophilic. I'm sorry, this, it's not a diamine, let's, let's back up. I can react my primary amine with another alkyl halide to get me the secondary amine, which is even more nucleophilic. And uh, then that can go on to react with some of the remaining alkyl halide to give me the tri-alkyl uh, amine, which is even more nucleophilic. And then that can go ahead and react with any remaining uh, alkyl halide to give me the quaternary ammonium, which then I'm done. The problem here is uh, each alkyl group you add to the amine uh, makes the, of course, makes the resulting amine more nucleophilic, and so you tend to get what's called overalkylation. Oh no, my amine is overalkylated. Um, so instead of using the SN2 reaction to make amines, <clears throat> in a lot of cases, organic chemists do uh, a two-step reaction series. Uh, the first would be to take this aldehyde and uh, add this primary amino group to it under catalytic acid conditions. And we've said before what some of those acids could be, maybe acetic acid. We're removing water to catalyze the formation of the imine. Now notice my desired product has one, two, three, four carbons. The imine has one, two, three, four carbons, but the imine has two bonds, uh, has three bonds to nitrogen, whereas the amino group has only two bonds to nitrogen. So we need to do a reduction reaction. So if we take this molecule and we add sodium borohydride, borohydride will deliver a hydride to the imine just the same way as it would deliver a hydride to a ketone or an aldehyde. And then in a workup step, Afterwards, when you quench with water, you get the desired amino group. So this is a two-step sequence. Make the imine, then reduce it to the amino group. And this is called, because of this, it involves forming an imine and then reducing it. It is called reductive amination. Reductive here not meaning that we're reducing someone's whole character to some one specific uh, trait, but rather we're reducing the carbon, the carbonyl carbon of the, of the imine. 
All right. Um, one, uh, at one point in my grad school experience, I was doing a reductive amination reaction and um, I ended up having to be a cautionary tale in our next research meeting because of what happened. It was really dumb. Uh, so there was a key molecule that we needed. We needed a lot of it. Uh, it, was a, it was an amino acid, but that's not necessarily important. Um, the reaction to make this molecule was pretty straightforward, but we kept having to do it again and again, and so I thought, I'm just going to make a ton of it. And I thought I could do this because uh, a fellow uh, lab mate previously, uh, his name was Justin Murray, he had made uh, a related molecule on an enormous scale. And I really, I really admired Justin, and uh, I thought that I could be as good a chemist as he was. Like uh, Obi-Wan thought he could train Anakin as good as Yoda. And so I set up this large scale reaction. It was a like 20 liter round bottom flask, which is enormous. Um, and set it up. Uh, and you can't sit something like that on a hot plate. You have to have something called a heating mantle, which is a uh, sort of an insulated cloth thing with glass wool and whatever and there's a heating element in it and you plug that in and uh, and then you need to stir the flask well I made the mistake of starting the reaction and then not waiting until it got up to reflux which is where it's boiling and you can tell everything's going to be okay it was supposed to go overnight uh, I was in a hurry so I just set up the reaction turned up the heat to what I thought was an appropriate level and then left which was stupid. Um, but at the time, uh, Nate, I, my first son, Nate, who's now a freshman, um, was young and invited to a birthday party, and we had to get him there, so I had to get home from work. So I left. About 10 at night, I get a call from uh, my, a, a good friend who was a postdoc in the group at that time. His name's Seth Horn. He's now a professor at uh, University of Pittsburgh. Anyway, he said, Josh, your reaction is all over the lab. Um, and it had bubbled over and spilled outside my fume hood down onto the floor, and so I had to leave and, and try to cover up my sins, as it were, by cleaning up everything. Uh, and then, of course, because my boss was going to find out anyway, I had to confess. And uh, then as part of forsaking my sins, I had to also confess again in front of the group at group meeting. I'm still confessing it today as I'm telling you about it. <laughs> Not one of my finer moments. So um, the moral of the story is if you're in the lab and you're trying a reaction that uh, you don't know how to do it, first, do it on a small scale, which I had done previously. But second, when you scale up, you need to be there because weird things can happen when you do uh, reactions on larger scale. Um, You've probably experienced that in the kitchen, right? Have you ever tried to make an enormous batch of something and it didn't go quite as well as when you were making a smaller batch? Same, same kind of principle. So that's advice for the future. Um, gospel living analogy. Uh, <laughs> confession, forsaking, humility. Um, small and simple means rather than great large steps, I guess. <laughs> I was trying to do some great thing. I don't know. You, you figure it out, OK? Um, all right. So I think that's enough on imine formation. We need to do one brief more thing to show you what happens when you take a secondary amine and react it with an aldehyde or ketone. Again, using catalytic acid. This is a secondary amine. The key step, and I'm going to skip all the mechanism until we get here. You remember how before the intermediate was an aminium ion where the amino group had a proton on it that we could remove. Right? When you use a secondary amine, there is no proton that you can remove on the nitrogen to get rid of the positive charge. Uh, so you're sort of stuck at this iminium ion stage, but we're going to do something similar to what we did with the pyridoxal phosphate chemistry. 
Notice that the carbon that's alpha to the carbonyl group, the alpha carbon, has protons on it. And notice that if we removed a proton with some base, perhaps the conjugate base of our acid, it wouldn't be as unfavorable as removing your just everyday run-of-the-mill CH bond because the resulting conjugate base is neutral and actually probably has the more stable resonance structure that looks like this. I don't like that five-membered ring, so I'm going to try it again. Okay, and this is called an enamine. Uh, your text drops the E in between the N and the A, so I think probably some people uh, will write it that way. That's fine, it's just that this E continues to be long. Nobody says enamine because that sounds like enema, and that's not, bio, that's not uh, chemical at all, right? So enamine. And enamines are useful for lots of things in OCHEM. Your text doesn't really talk about that, but you can use these as nucleophiles. And perhaps later on when we start talking about other things we can do with the alpha carbon, I'll return to uses of enamines. Uh, hydrolyzing enamines is exactly the same thing as hydrolyzing imines, so I'm not going to show that here. You can review that. Go ahead. That's yes, the question is, is the step to form the aminium ion the same as before? Yes. You're going to protonate the carbonyl oxygen, then the nitrogen attacks. You get a tetrahedral intermediate. You use proton transfer to swap who's the good leaving group. Nitrogen kicks down, water leaves. That gets you to the aminium ion. Okay? Good. What else? Okay. So uh, in the last little bit, I think this is going to be sort of a smorgasbord of uh, reactions. We're not going to spend a lot of time on any one of them. Uh, I want you to be able to do them and sort of predict the products, senses, uh, and be able to use them in a synthesis, but we're not going to focus a lot on mechanism. Uh, and the reason is that these don't necessarily fit neatly into uh, the types of things we've talked about before. Uh, the first is um, using aldehydes and ketones with uh, CN minus as the nucleophile. And the product that forms from that, your text calls a cyanohydrin. Um, these can be useful synthetically, and there are examples of cyanohydrins that are available in biology. Um, your text mentions a couple of those, and, and I won't talk about them in a lot of detail. I'm mostly concerned that those of you that have standardized exams in your future that'll test you on OCHEM, perhaps the DAT or the MCAT, might encounter this, so I want you to at least have seen it before. So if you take an aldehyde or a ketone, and you react it with CN minus, usually the sodium salt, and you need a little bit of acid to catalyze this process. Uh, the process probably involves protonating the oxygen, then CN minus attacking, but when that happens, you get this molecule, which has the OH and the CN on the same carbon. That's a tetrahedral intermediate of sorts, but we no longer have a good leaving group on it. CN minus is not that great of a leaving group, neither is OH minus. Uh, you don't use a lot of acid here because you only need a catalytic amount. Uh, the problem is that uh, if you use too much acid, you protonate HCN and it becomes, you protonate CN minus, it becomes HCN hydrogen cyanide, which is a toxic poisonous gas. It smells like almonds. So if you're trying to do this in the lab and you smell almonds, you should run away, but you're probably already dead. Um, so be careful. Um, 
the reason this is useful synthetically is that you can do stuff with CN groups. Uh, those are called nitriles. And uh, notice that the nitrile carbon, oh, yikes, I went, meant, meant this. The nitrile carbon has three bonds to a heteroatom. Uh, I won't show you this mechanism, but we will just mention it briefly. You can use a strong acid and heat to convert that nitrile into a carboxylic acid. And uh, then you've not only made a new carbon-carbon bond, but you've converted the, the molecule where you made this new carbon-carbon bond into something that's synthetically useful. This is called an alpha hydroxy acid. And I think, I think maybe alpha hydroxy acids used to be advertised as used in like cosmetic products, lotions and stuff, I don't know. Uh, exfoliators, I don't know. Um, Okay, so that's one reaction to be aware of. I'm not going to test you on the mechanism of this reaction. I just want you to know uh, what the products are and then what this next synthetic step is. You can, if you want to, you can draw the mechanism for this reaction. It's straightforward. The text has it. Uh, and it may help you remember the reaction if you do the mechanism. So feel free to do that. But I'm not going to test you on this mechanism. Okay? Uh, questions about that reaction? Sorry, I mean, I hate to do sort of disconnected reactions. Here's this reaction, remember it, but go ahead. So the synthetic step is changing the C triple bond into the N to the carboxylic acid? Well, I mean, both of this is technically synthesis. What I, I guess what I'm meaning is this step is really useful because it takes simple starting materials, makes a new carbon-carbon bond, and then the carboxylic acid is just a really, really useful group. You can do lots with it. Um, I'll point out that carbon-carbon bond forming is really kind of hard in organic chemistry, so anytime you can do it, anytime you add a new carbon-carbon bond forming reaction to your uh, repertoire or your toolbox, you should be sort of excited and say, yay. We've done that previously uh, when we were adding Grignard reagents or organolithiums or cuprates to aldehydes and ketones and so on. Uh, speaking of carbon-carbon bond forming reactions, the last thing we need to do in this chapter is to talk about the Wittig reaction. If you say Wittig reaction, people will laugh at you. This is named after a German chemist, Georg Wittig, who won the Nobel Prize in 1979, which you think sounds a gazillion years ago, but it's not because it's the year that I was born and I'm only 23, right? <laughs> um, 42, 42. Uh, so this reaction will take an aldehyde or a ketone and uh, it will, hmm, and you use something called the Wittig reagent. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Um, And the Wittig reagent looks like this. You have a carbon-phosphorus bond with a positive formal charge on phosphorus, and then this carbon uh, is negatively charged. This type of reagent is called an ILID. You haven't seen this before. The phosphorus has a positive formal charge because it's from the same column of the periodic table as nitrogen. It comes with five valence electrons, but it only owns four because it's involved in four sigma bonds, so its formal charge is plus. And having that positive charge there makes it um, uh, reasonable to have a negative charge on the adjacent carbon. What happens when you do this reaction is you convert the carbon carbon uh, carbon oxygen double bond into a carbon carbon double bond where stereo isomers are possible you would get both one two three one two three you would get both varieties and so the Wittig reaction is a really great way to stitch two different molecules together 
into the same part and you make a new carbon-carbon bond. Um, the byproduct, what happens to the phosphorus here, you form triphenylphosphine oxide. Notice there that phosphorus is involved in five bonds, which is okay because phosphorus is bigger and has more space for more groups. Carbon, first and second row elements, second row elements don't form generally more than four bonds. Beyond that, uh, they can. Uh, reasons for that aren't going to be important in this class and also I'm not going to test you on what the structure of this molecule is. So um, does that look kind of weird? <laughs> You're taking this portion and this portion of the molecule and you're linking them together. So this is sort of a Lego type reaction. You just take two parts and click, all right? Um, so what about this illid reagent? Where do we get it from? You can buy triphenylphosphine, though you have to, it oxidizes easily, so you have to keep it um, under an inert atmosphere. You can do the SN2 reaction where you generate this phosph what's called a phosphonium salt counter ion is your halide that's just the SN2 reaction except that 2 doesn't look like a 2 then uh, we use a strong base in this case an organolithium reagent uh, this is called N-butyl lithium, and we use that strong base to remove a proton from the phosphonium salt. That gets us to the Wittig reagent, which is nucleophilic on carbon because you can see it's got the negative charge on that carbon. All right. So what do we do with the Wittig reagent? Um, let's show this reaction happening with the ketone. We line up the phosphorus with the oxygen and the negatively charged carbon with the carbonyl carbon. And in this step, we're gonna do something that should look somewhat familiar. We're going to have uh, the nucleophilic carbon attack the carbonyl carbon because that's where the LUMO is. It's attacking the pi star. At the same time, we're going to break the carbon-oxygen double bond. And then lone pair electrons on the oxygen are actually going to attack the phosphorus. It would seem reasonable for them to just stay on the oxygen, but oxygen-phosphorus bonds are strong. And because phosphorus can have more than four bonds, the bond between oxygen and phosphorus just happens. And you can experimentally observe the intermediate I'm going to draw. It's a weird four-membered ring. Okay, here is, let's see, here is the portion from my ketone. Here is the portion from, oops, need another color. Here is the portion from my illid. All right, we need to be done there. We'll, we'll uh, pick that up next time and then move on to the next chapter.